Amen. Thank you. So we have new mics. Another announcement. New mics. These mics, if they cut out like they were just kind of cutting on Impala, there's a little button below the on-off button called frequency. Come back on because it will find a new frequency, and hopefully this one's better than the one that was getting interference. So feel free to push the frequency button as frequently as you would like to. You like that? All right. Me too. Okay, so while we were worshiping, I just kept being drawn to uh, Ezra and Zara. Like, can anybody hear them this morning? And, and I felt the delight of the Lord over it. Like, the sound of, I'm going to push it again. The sound of children in this room is really important to the Lord. Like, that's not disruptive to what the Holy Spirit is doing. That's not disruptive to the Lord at all. It's, like, essential. It's the sign of health. It's like a heartbeat. Like, if you don't have a heartbeat, you're in trouble. So he wanted me to read this over us. This is 1 John 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God. Just look at somebody and say, you're, the chi- you're a child of God. Now, this comes, with, uh, this comes with strings attached. I want you to hear the strings that are attached to this, okay? Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. Look at that same person and say, I don't know who you're going to be. <laughs> okay? It's not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, speaking of Jesus, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. This has massive implications for how you get sanctified or how you get holy or how you get to be like Jesus. Right now, it's very tempting to assume we know what Jesus wants us to be, but you don't know. You don't know. In fact, every writer of the New Testament says the same thing. We don't know. I don't know exactly who he wants me to be. I don't know the good works he has laid up for me. But I know this, that when I see him, I will be like him. And this is the place where you start to get purified. If you just assume Jesus wants a person that doesn't swear, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, doesn't do any of that bad stuff. If you just assume that on the front end, you will not purify yourself. You will try. You will burn yourself out. You will wear yourself out, but you won't know God and you won't be clean to him. You have to be a person that says, I don't know how to even become the person. I don't even know who he wants me to be. But this one thing I know, that when I see him, I will be like him. And therefore, I'm going to take that next step. I'm going to let him purify me this next place. So when we hear kids in this place, to remember that he sees us this way. He's actually looking at us and saying, you don't know what I want you to be. Stop trying so hard to be the thing that you think I want you to be. Let me talk to you. Hear me. Listen to me. And that's what we're going to be talking about today is listening to God. Okay. Now to the notes. There are, anybody count how many pages of notes? Did it feel heavy to you today? It's nine pages. Thank you, Vince. Vince is paying attention. These feel heavy. Is Tom going to talk about all these notes? No. In fact, I want to just jump. I want to cut out about half of them right at the get-go. Let's go to the the very last three pages. Five, starting on page five. Five, six, seven, eight, nine. Not four pages. I want you to look at this with me for a second. This is from my eSword Bible program that looks like it was invented in 1997. But I love it because I know how to use it. These are all of the instances in the New King James Version of the word faith, okay? There are 229 verses on these four pages. There are 245 references to the word faith. So that means that some of the verses have faith in them twice, okay? Now, 243 of these verses out of 245, or 243 of these occurrences of the word faith out of 245 are in the New Testament. So I want you to look at that very first page. Which ones are not in the New Testament? Somebody yell them out. Deuteronomy 32.20, Habakkuk 2.4. All the rest of the passages that use the word faith as translated by the New King James Version are in the New Testament. Why are all those faith verses in the New Testament? Somebody tell me. 
Holy Spirit, yes, you cannot have faith lest it be given to you by the Holy Spirit. It takes the Holy Spirit to have faith. So we're going to be talking today about faith, and none of these things that we're going to say are they a condemnation of who you are or an accusation about what you don't do or what you don't believe. They are an invitation for people to open our hearts and let the Holy Spirit do something that only he can do. He wants to do something radically different than you think he wants to do with your life. He actually, in a, God sees you in a million years, and he sees you impactful, beautiful, powerful, uh, righteous, clean, free, no anxiety. One day, I was driving down 131. I was going to speak at a, a dumb work thing, like that I didn't, I used to hate public speaking. Like it would literally make me want to throw up. I'd get cold sweats. I'd worry about it for three days before I had to do it. And as soon as I got out of it, I felt free. And I was going to one of these things. It was 2010 and it was the summer of 2010. I was driving up to Grand Rapids and I'm like, I was praying about Sunday school at the church we were at at the time. And I was just telling God, God, there's not enough people. There's not enough, be enough people for Sunday school. And I'm just picturing all this work and all these kids. I was just stressed. And I had to go talk at this thing that I didn't want to talk about. I had, I had no interest in talking about my job. I wanted to talk about Jesus all the time, just to people, not in public. And I was just like, he's just like, Tom, I hear your prayer. And he zapped me. I don't know how to describe it other than he took all of the weight off of me. I felt like I could only see light. In fact, I thought I was going to crash my truck. I was, dry, I was right on M6, like coming off of 131 onto M6, and there's like a weird interchange there where you're going through, and I felt like I couldn't see anything. I couldn't, I didn't, felt like I wasn't even on earth, and it was just light and freedom all around me. I felt so weightless and unworried and at the same time sober that I wasn't in control of anything that was happening right there. He's going to make you like this forever, free, full of light, okay. Like he's going to take you places forever and do stuff with you. And you don't have to worry about the resources that are there or how it's going to work or what he has planned or whether or not he's faithful or whether or not he's good. And that's what he's trying to teach us right now is faith. He's trying to teach us to trust him with the promises that he's given us. It was what Noah prophesied. He's trying to teach us to trust him, to believe the promise, and not try to make it happen on our own, not feel all the weight and responsibility to make things happen. And what that means is if you really get to that place, you stop thinking other people are going to mess up the thing that God is doing. And if we could live like this, the world would be so radically different. If we could just be a people that believe God is good, he's going to do the thing he promised, and no one else is going to mess it up, we'd stop trying to get everybody else to get it right, and we'd open our hearts and let God lead us. Do you see what I'm saying? This is all rooted in simply having confidence that you can hear God. You have to have confidence that God rewards those who diligently seek him. And you guys diligently seek him. So that means the reward is knowing what God wants. He wants you confident that he rewards those who diligently seek him. That's the definition of faith in Hebrews 11. Okay, so all of these passages that I listed here, the things I'm going to say today, and I've already taken seven minutes to tell you what I'm going to say. They all agree with every single one of these verses about faith. And I want you to check me on them if you feel like you want to go deeper. I think that'd be the most helpful thing is to be like, okay, he said this thing. How does that agree with these passages? And look and see, can you find any passages about faith that disagree with the things I'm about to say? Okay. So Holy Spirit in this room, open our hearts. You can sow seed even into iron, even into hard soil, but God you can do miraculous things. Even where we're hard, you can still come in if we just say we want it. So, God, we want you to put things in our hearts that we've never heard before. In Jesus' name, amen. Item one, the flesh. When I say the flesh, what I mean is the way you think, the emotions you feel. When you wake up in the morning, whatever feeling you got, if you haven't been in prayer or asking God to touch you with his emotions, that's your emotions. That's the flesh. Whatever you're thinking, whatever you're feeling, and whatever you plan to do about your issues, your problems, your joys, your satisfaction, that's the flesh. And then your body, too. Like your appetite, your kind of natural appetites. The flesh only sees two options. This thing's good. This thing's bad. If you really mine it out, you will see, even if you believe in multiple options, you will find that you're always trying to find the good one and the bad one. The dichotomy. This is good, therefore this must be bad. This is bad, therefore this must be good. This is all delusion. Mankind was never meant to think this way. It was, it was always supposed to be beyond our responsibility 
to think this way, and I want to show you the biblical passages about this. You have a problem called reasons. You have reasons that you think certain things are good and certain things are bad, and you're not always wrong and you're not always right. And that's the problem, is you can hit some of them some of the time and convince yourself that you have wisdom, but you don't. What you have is a sense of right and wrong without any leadership of God without God. You have a sense of good and evil. And this was a curse. This is actually what Adam and Eve ate the fruit and got this sense, and it broke everything. Your idea of what's good and what's bad is the problem, okay? But you can't take that information in the flesh and be like, okay, I'm just going to think I don't know good from evil and just do whatever feels right. That's even worse, okay? That's called depravity. You don't want to do that either. Now listen, Adam and Eve lost faith. Everybody say faith or a right vision of who God is. That's what faith is. Faith is a right vision of who God is. Is God hard? No, he's kind. Is he uh, impatient? No, he's patient. Is he stingy? No, he's actually really generous. Faith is a right view of who God is, okay? Now, when Adam and Eve lost faith, or a right vision of God, it cost them two more things. It cost them hope, or a right vision in what God had for them, okay? Okay? So if you think wrong about who God is, then you'll also think wrong about what he's going to do with you, okay? That's hope. They lost hope, and then they lost love. Now, love is expressed in the Bible for human beings is obedience. When you love God, you obey him. In fact, Jesus said that in John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, obey my commandments. Now, he wasn't saying, obey me so you can prove that you love me. He was saying, if you feel loved, because you can't love him unless you feel loved by him first. If you feel loved, you'll obey me. That's that what I was reading in that 1 John 3 passage. Everyone who has this hope purifies themselves. Everyone who knows, you don't know what you're going to be. You don't know what God wants you to be. But you can have confidence that if you seek him, you're going to end up like him. Then you'll purify yourself. You actually get in the step-by-step process of him telling you things are good or evil that you didn't even know about. Like before you knew certain things were evil, you didn't know they were sin. You actually weren't sinning according to the Bible. But as soon as you know, you are if you don't do things in faith. According to the Bible. This is, this is biblical doctrine that I'm telling you. And so it's easy to look at the world that doesn't have the Holy Spirit and be like, all of them are sinning. But God doesn't look at it actually that way. He says, no, I gave you the Holy Spirit. I gave you the one who knows the difference between good and evil for real. I expect more from you. Because I put God inside of you. Do you see what I'm saying? The wrong attitude is to look at the world and be like, all this sexual sin, all this murder, all this hatred, all this violence, this is all the sin God's dealing with. No, God's actually bringing his kingdom from inside of people that want his leadership. So We have to recognize the most sin is going to happen in the place that should know the most, that should know the best of what he wants, Okay. This is very important. This will change a lot about how we think about God's sin and what he wants from us and freedom. Okay, so I just ask, Holy Spirit, release freedom in this room. Genesis 3.1. Now, this is at the beginning of the Bible. Like, most kids know this story about Adam and Eve eating the apple, or the fruit. I guess it doesn't say apple. I kind of picture apples. Now, the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. What does that mean, that he was more cunning? He's smart. He's tricky. He kind of knew how the machine works. He's like, I got how this machine works, okay? He was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, something slippery, something cunning, something smart, tricky, tricksy. He has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He asked her a question. What did God say? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it. Nor shall you touch it. Did God say don't touch it? No, he did not. Lest you die. Right away, Satan was exposing a wrong view of God. She was already thinking, God is a little more strict than he said. He said, yeah, we shouldn't eat it, but he meant we shouldn't touch it. Yes, that's who he is. Right there, faith was lost. Then hope was lost. Suddenly, what Satan was offering her as a good future seemed better than the one from that hard guy who said, yeah, don't eat it and don't touch it. But he never said that. That's not who he was. That's not who he is. There are things you're assuming about God that aren't right. Now, I can tell you this with confidence because everyone that knows God in the Bible 
specifically the nation of Israel, they took what God said and they added some hamburger helper to the hamburger. And they were like, yeah, he said we shouldn't have the, you know, we have to honor the Sabbath. And they turned it into all these human laws about how to honor the Sabbath. This is what David was talking about last week. And it became something much harder than what God had said, which Jesus came and said, no, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. You just have a wrong view of God. You don't know the Father. And what that's doing is it's destroying faith. And then you're hopeless. And then you don't obey him because you don't feel loved. So we have to get out of this cycle of death. That's, this is literally what makes the trees lose their leaves and not bear fruit every month. This is, this is broken. You know this, right? Do you know that scientists, when they drill for oil in the Arctic, they find palm branches under the ice? Do you know that the whole earth had a different atmosphere before the fall of man? The whole earth had a different atmosphere before the flood of Noah. The whole earth is very different. And if you don't believe me, look at Genesis 3, more of it, and you'll find out the plants started to grow different. And God was like, before, you were eating of all the trees of the garden. Now you got to, you know, scratch the ground just to get enough to eat. Everything changed when faith, hope, and love were lost. So what the Holy Spirit wants to lead you to is to have confidence that God likes you, wants to talk to you. And if you just try to hear him, though it is very difficult to hear him, he will turn you into a person who is like him. If you're willing to take that risk, it's called faith. It's a risk. It's belief that he rewards those who diligently seek him. Now, when this is easy to talk about in church meeting, theoretically, yeah, we should definitely, you know, try to believe what he's saying to us. And we have these meetings where, you know, we kind of come up and we say, even, you know, hey, I feel like he's saying this about this part of the body or he wants to do this or he's saying, you know, the, the amazing words that he gave this morning. Those are way easier than what do you do about your kid that's walking away from the Lord? Or what do you do about your bank account that doesn't have enough money in it to pay the bills this week? Or what do you do when the, the choices to obey God are so costly to your relationships or to the way that you feel? And he's like, listen, I just want you to take the next step of trying to hear me and agree with me. Don't try to fix all the problems. Just take the next step with me. Take the weight off of yourself. You're a kid. I'm a dad, Okay. Now, the seed of doubt in God's character was already present in Eve. And Satan just found something God already knew was there. That's why he let Satan do it. He wants a group of voluntary lovers. He doesn't want people that were tricked into loving him. He doesn't want people that never ate the fruit, never figured it out. He actually wants people that see eating the fruit was the biggest mistake I ever made. He wants people that say, I just want to trust you. I just want to believe what you say is good is good. And what you say is evil is evil. And not put myself above God. That's what he's looking for, okay? So the seed of doubt in God's character was already present in Eve. She was already lying to herself about how strict God was. Anybody else in the room can relate to Eve? Can anybody else here relate to, I think God's really kind of tough. He's not. I just want to declare to you, he's not. If he was, we'd all be dead. <laughs> Generations ago, he would have ended the human race. If he was hard. I mean, look at the human race. He's very patient, incredibly patient, okay? Very kind, very gentle, long-suffering. So she was already lying to herself about how strict God was. This has been happening since man was made. How hard. This concept manifests itself throughout the history of God's people. Jewish law becoming more and more onerous over time. It says over this, but that's a typo. It should be over time. Genesis 3, 4. Pick up, picking up that story that we just stopped at. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. Was that true? No, that was a lie. Did she see it as a lie? No, she already doubted God's character. Do you see, if you don't really believe in faith and who God says he is, you're way more susceptible to lies. You're already, like, you already kind of think he's not what he says he is. So she was ready to believe lies about him and impart that into her own future. What a terrible idea, right? I mean, what a terrible idea to not believe in his goodness that he made her. They walked and talked with him, she, but she had this doubt about how he wanted her to respond to him, and it opened her heart to believe all kinds of false things about him. This is happening to us right now. It's very worth it to go to war against doubt about God's character about you. He loves you so much. You don't feel it like he, does, like he feels it. None of us feel it. Like, if we could, love would perfect us. We'd be bold for the day of judgment. You see somebody bold for the day of judgment, they feel love. They're learning how to feel love. That's what it says in 1 John 3. 
Okay, so love is perfected in this, that we have boldness in the day of judgment because judgment involves torment and he doesn't want to torment you. Okay, so then the serpent said to the woman, he lied, you sure, sure, surely shall not die. You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open. Everybody say eyes open. And you will be like God. This is your main problem. Your eyes are opened. Your eyes are opened upon something that was never yours to have your eyes opened upon. Your eyes were opened upon what's good and what's evil. It was never God's desire that that happened, though he allowed it to happen to get voluntary love. So you've seen something you really weren't supposed to see. And I'm going to show you this in this passage. Don't take my word for it. See it in the passage. Now listen to me. Stay with me for just a second. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, what was she doing right there? She started to look with new eyes, right? She's like, oh, that kind of looks good for food. It's pleasant to my eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened. Satan wasn't lying about this part. Their eyes were opened. That's what broke everything. All of their reasons. Now they suddenly had reasons for deciding, this is good, this is evil. This is the thing we should do. This is not the thing we should do. This is how we're going to address this sin. They had an idea. They had their eyes open. They never would have had that idea before they ate the fruit. They would have never thought about fig leaves. They wouldn't have even known that nakedness was a sin. They wouldn't have known it was less than. They wouldn't have known they weren't covered. They wouldn't know. Their eyes were open, and they started to see things that God said, that's good. I like seeing you. I made all of your parts. I'm not ashamed of who you are. I'm not ashamed of the way you're made. Now, you have to remember, they were covered in light. They were wearing garments of light. But he saw through the garments of light. Just he's like he sees through your clothes right now. He's not ashamed of what you look like. He's not ashamed of what he made you. He likes it. He's like, yes, this is good. He made man. He said, this is very good. He made the dogs. We had a dog in our house. The dog is awesome, but not as good as the sun. Very good, Jonah. You're very good. And the dog's good, too. But he called mankind very good different than all the rest of his creation. We have to understand we see things way different than God sees them. And in our arrogance, we think we know what they mean. Because we're in a culture that all thinks it knows what it means. We get confidence in the wrong meaning of all the things that we see. Look around. Does the culture know how to get righteousness out of the earth? No. I mean, clearly, no. But the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit does, okay? And so all of our assumptions about this is what God wants me to do to fix my sin, they're wrong. They're just on their face wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that everything you think about it is wrong. It means that the whole totality that you could even do anything about your sin is wrong. It's wrong. There's some things you've been taught to think are right because a whole church culture has decided these are right things, but those will never make you righteous, Only knowing God will make you righteous. Some people throughout history have known God, and other people have seen them, and they lived on their passion. They didn't have a fire of their own, and they made up a formula in order to copy the thing that they saw God doing in someone else. And over thousands of years, we've come up with a whole system even worse than the Jewish law called a false knowing of God and the arrogance of man thinking, this is what we'll do to help him with his kingdom. It's crazy. It's ludicrous. Now the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. This is the very first sin, was trying to do something about their lack, about their shame. The very first sin was the, the coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. Now why do I say that? Why do, why do I say that the very first sin was the coverings? Because they didn't really know sin until they found themselves in it. When they ate the fruit, they didn't know sin. But once they knew, once their eyes were opened, everything they did was sin. Everything. This is what the Bible says. Anything not done in faith is sin. It really is. Then the eyes of the both of them were open, and they knew they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves covering. Then they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves. Do you see? Once they lost faith, they lost hope, and they lost love. They're hiding from the one that they loved, that loved them. They're hiding from the very one that could fix the mistake that they made. And he will. And he did. But they're hiding from him. Do you know this is what you do when you find out your sin? You start trying to hide from God. But he's the one that's going to fix it. 
He's the one that he, he gave his son on the cross to deal with the thing you're trying to hide from him. And he's like, don't hide it from me. Just take the next step with me. I'm not expecting you to fix everything. I just want you to take the next step with me. Learn how to hear me. Let me tell you what to do next. Don't just assume you know. You don't know. Nobody knows. Look at the world. It's a mess. Look at the church. The church is a crazy mess. No one knows. God knows. God knows. Okay? And he, he, Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded that you should not eat? It was all about knowing something and misinterpreting it. Knowing something, seeing something that really wasn't in Adam's pay grade to see, and then trying to decide what to do about it. But he created the problem. Nakedness wasn't a problem. It was what he was trying to do about it that became the problem. Do you see what I'm saying? This is the church. This is us. This is Israel. This is God's people. We're supposed to be a people that we don't figure out what to do about it. We find out what he thinks about us right now when we move forward with him. It's what Sam was prophesying. She was prophesying, don't worry about all the stuff that's already happened. Do you want to today go forward with him into the next thing, the next step? There's a door open. A door just requires a next step. What's beyond the door? You don't know. We're going to find out. And it's not a statement about any other church being real or not being real. It's an invitation to us to be real. This is great. If we're real, chances are he loves everybody. He's talking to somebody else about being real, too. We're going to find a bunch of real people moving forward with him. That's the promise of the Bible. Okay? So from here on, Adam and Eve began blame shifting. That's one of the very first signs you find out faith, hope, and love are gone. You're trying to figure out. Who did it? <laughs> Who made this mess? So God asks him what happened, and Adam's like, that one. And that one is like, that one. <laughs> she blames the snake. But the truth is, God let the snake into the garden because there was something in Eve and Adam that didn't see God right. This is why God let trouble into Job's life, right? Job said, before I heard about you, now I've seen you. So you have to understand, there's some things you're walking through. There's some sin God's identifying in your life, not because he doesn't like you, because he does like you, and he's letting those things be wrestled with so you'll come to the idea, you know what, no matter what I do, I'm not going to be holy. I just want to know you. <laughs> if I know you, oh my word, I'm becoming more holy. Like, I like being like you because I like you. That's how it works. That's the only people that get saved, get saved this way, what, the way I'm describing it to you. There's no other way. Any other gate is for robbers and thieves. Jesus is the only gate. He's the only way. And he went and found people that were deep in sin. He's like, I like you. Come follow me. And they were like, okay. Did, were they completely sinless when they started following him? No. I'm getting ahead of myself in the notes. Okay. So since the fall or separation of man and God, the flesh operates in trying to decide what's good or what's evil, black or white. Only two options. Impatient dichotomies. Dichotomy just means two things, two halves. Based on what we see, or we say see, and what we feel about it. So it's very tempting when there's a challenge, especially in the church, to look at it, pray about it, Lord, help me to make the right decision. Look at it again and think about it. Is any of that prophetic? No. That's not hearing God. Hearing God is, I see the problem. I don't see it right. God, how do you see this problem? Like, is it good? Is it evil? This terrible thing is happening to this person. Should I rush in and help them? And he's like, that would be evil because I'm not rushing in and helping them. But it looks evil if I don't help them. Well, that's because you don't know what I'm doing in them. You haven't seen the whole thing yet. Come up with me for a minute. Let me talk to you about you. <laughs> Let me talk to you about you, why you want to fix everything, why you want to be God. It's what Jen was prophesying to song. You feel like you got to be God in this situation, but I'm actually telling you, I see something similar in you, and I'm trying to fix it in you. That's why you see them there. It's all about what we see and what we reason once we see it. But if you were willing to take a minute and be like, I see this thing. I don't know what to do about it. God sees it even more than I do. He does know what to do about it. God, I want to see what you see and feel what you feel. He will give you faithfully faint impressions of his heart that he then expects you to act on. Once he tells you something, if you don't act on it, it's sin. And we're like, oh, right. Seeing something without you, that's the original sin. Seeing something with you, that was the original righteousness. That was the original righteousness. 
So I'm just willing to say, God, I don't see this thing right, even the sin in my own life. What do we do next about it? He might have a different plan than you. He might think something different about it than you. And that thing, I guarantee you, if you're just trying to hear him, will be much more effective than whatever it is you could have done. Those fig leaves were never going to deal with the problem. Death is what dealt with the problem. God actually killed some animals and covered them with hides as a picture of his own son ultimately covering us with his righteousness. The only thing that's going to make your sin go away is the blood of Jesus. I want to tell you that right now. The only thing that's going to make the stain of rebellion go away is the blood of Jesus. There's nothing mankind can add to the effort. So we die to ourselves, and his blood starts flowing through us and washing the earth. That's the only way it's going to work, okay? The more we find out, the more we see our reasons aren't consistent across every decision. So this is the thing. When you start following the Holy Spirit, you start looking at problems with the Holy Spirit. I found this out the hard way, not the easy way. When I first started to hear God talk to me, it was actually 2011 was the, when I got the biggest increase in my ability to hear God. And when that started to happen, I thought, man, everybody's going to want to hear what God's got to say. And I was so happy. Like, I want to go to meetings and tell people what God had to say. And I found out quickly, people don't really want to hear that if it doesn't agree with what everybody already thinks. So you have to understand that there's, there's this, uh, the more we find out, the more we see that our reasons aren't consistent. So when I started to tell people, this is what I feel like the Lord is saying, that we should do in this thing. And I got to start several of these kinds of places over the course of a few years. And when these things would start to start to happen, I'd be like, hey, I think we're supposed to do this thing. And then another time I'd be like, well, actually, the way that God sees it is different. Authority works this way in this situation. People started to say, that's, that's inconsistent. That doesn't work that way. But we have to understand the way that the world is the more we know, the more we see our own logic is inconsistent. God is not inconsistent. The way that the Holy Spirit does things, it's completely consistent. It's just we can't see the blueprint of the way that he works. But I want you to think about COVID-19 for just a second. Everybody has an idea. These are the rules. If we lay down these rules, then we're going to be saving the most human life. We're going to be doing the most good. We're going to be causing the least amount of disruption. Over time, we found out you can't apply those rules consistently, right? Right? There's always like some variable. There's always like some reason. Somebody has this good reason for doing this thing that's outside of the rules. And that the whole group is like, no, you have to obey the rules. And this person sees it like, but yeah, but in this situation, the rule doesn't make any sense. And everybody else is like, no, it makes sense to us. And until they find themselves in the spot where the, the tide shifts against them. And they're like, wait a second, that doesn't make any sense. Our rules are inconsistent. Our vision is inconsistent. Our formulas are inconsistent. Hard-hearted people are like, let's get some better formulas. <laughs> people God is saving are like, the formulas don't work. We got to hear God. We have to hear God. It's the only way any of this is going to work, is hearing God and, and understanding my logic, my reasons. When I look at something and I think good or evil, that's the original sin right there without God. It's not that he doesn't have an opinion about what's good or evil. It's that my opinion without him is wrong. It's wrong. So I take a step back. And I let him tell me what his opinion is. And a lot of times it rubs my skin, my, you know, my fur the wrong way. And I'm like, one of us is wrong and I'm pretty sure it's not God. Sometimes I think it is God. <laughs> Those are the times that are worst for me. But if one of us is wrong, it's not God. So I have to humble myself and say, I can't really do anything about this until I know what God wants to do. I found many situations like this in my life in the last 10, 15 years where I see the wisdom of God. My mode when I first became a parent was to discipline anything bad out of my kids. It doesn't work. It will just ruin your relationship with your kids. So over time, what I found was God saw some things that I thought were bad that were really kind of about me being embarrassed. And there were some things that I was like, let that thing slide. And he was like, you can't. Do you love the child? And over time, he changed me. And I think my kids would testify of this. He changed me to the point where I recognize I don't really know how to be a good dad. But I know a good dad. And I let him tell me things that change me over time. And hopefully in 10 years, I'm going to be a better dad than I am right now. And that's good because I'm going to need to be. Because there's more challenges in the earth over time. That's why it says that as we see the day of his coming approach, we need to stir each other up in love and good works. Why? Why would the challenges increase in our season? Jesus is coming. We're getting closer to God. Does the human race know more than it did before? Why? 
internet. You've got literally every encyclopedia known to man at, in, in your phone. Does mankind see more than man's ever seen before? Why? Technology. You know what's going on on the other side of the world within minutes of it happening. Does mankind have more opinions now than it ever had before? Why? Because we know more, we see more, and we can look up more, we can form what we think is an informed opinion more, but we can't have the humility to look back at the human race and say, there's never been righteousness apart from Jesus. There never will be righteousness apart from Jesus. We actually have to take a step back and say, oh, this is the unsealing of all things. People are running to and fro. Knowledge is increasing. Sin is increasing. I need to get to the place where I hear God more. I have to hear God more right now. That's the problem, okay? So the more we find out, the more we see our reasons aren't consistent across every decision. COVID-19 is a great example. The arrogant try to get better reasons or formulas. The humble are broken by judgment. They're just, they find themselves more needy, less sure, less confident in what man can do, but more confident in what God will do. Job 38, 1 to 4. Our reasons are less formed than God's. When we, we were... We weren't there when he made everything. Another typo, item F. We weren't there when God made everything. We weren't there when he laid out the foundation of the world, made man's heart, decided the rules of love, the rules of logic and wisdom and revelation. Wisdom in, in Proverbs 4 says, I set my table. It's a banquet of stuff to eat. I call out to everyone, come and eat wisdom. And very few will do it. And, he's, and wisdom says, I'll mock them in the day of judgment. They'll have no wisdom. They'll just be confusion, reacting, depraved, bouncing against each other, trying to get other people to fix the problems of the world and growing more angry, more cold, more closed off, less able to hear. Do you see that happening right now? That's where the culture is. Now listen, Job 38, 1 to 4. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, whirlwind and said, who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Who is he talking to? Did he like Job? A lot. Job was the most righteous man described in the entire book of Job. And he says, Job, your opinion about why this is happening, it's darkness in the light of my glory. But Job was the only one that was telling the truth. Think about that for a second. He says, Job, who is this who darkens counsel by, you got too many words, Job, too many opinions about why this is going on. You were doing better when you were sitting there quiet. You were doing better when you said he gives and takes away. I don't know what he's doing. But as soon as Job started pontificating on all the things God had been doing and why, God was like, you're darkening counsel by words. Do you have a lot of words about what's happening, why, what should be done for everyone but you? How we should fix this? Feeling righteous, feeling like, hey, this is what God wants. We got to go fix this. We got to go fix that. He's like, you're darkening counsel with words. Will you listen to me? Will you just take a step back? Let me tell you, I'm a good God. See me right first. I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. I made you. If I would have hurt you, I wouldn't have made you in the first place. You know, he would say that confidently to all of us. I made you to pour out good things on you. I'm not hurting you at all. See me right. Were you there when I made you? Then have hope. Yeah, this is a momentary light affliction, but it's going to result in something really good. And then you'll have obedience. You'll have love. Right? Okay, now listen. Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. Do you say prepare yourself like God? No. He says, all right, you get your reasons ready, and I'll get mine ready, Job. And he gives two chapters of his reasons to Job's reasons. Was Job feeling pretty confident about his reasons at the end? No. He was like, I abhor myself in dust and ashes. You ask me these questions, I'm not even qualified to answer them, God. But just before this, I mean, he had an answer for everybody. <laughs> everybody. And God liked him. The other guys were lying about God. He was telling the truth about God. But his reasons were wrong. His reasons were wrong. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? He would, he would say this to all of us about all of our opinions that haven't been brought before his throne. And we asked him what he thought about our sin and about our relationships, and about what other people were doing, and about what he wants to do in this church, what he wants to do in this city, what's he, what he wants to do with COVID-19, what he wants to do with abortion, what he wants to do with abortion, what he wants to do with gay marriage, what he wants to do with all these things. We don't know. We don't know. He's uncovering something in the human heart profoundly right now. He uncovered something in the human heart profoundly in the Roman Empire before it fell. 
Do you know you wouldn't know most about what you know about Christianity had he not uncovered darkness in the Roman Empire and destroyed it? It changed things. So we're like, all this darkness, this is anti-God. And all the lights here, this is pro-God. And we'll decide what's good and what's evil. And we'll tell everybody what they should do. And we know what we should do. And he's like, it's the darkness, actually, that's darkening my counsel in the church. I like you. I really like you. I love you, actually. But you've got the Holy Spirit. You could see your unrighteousness right now. And listen to me about what to do about you next. Just the next step. Do you see what I'm saying? Where were you when I laid the foundation here? Tell me if you have understanding. We're supposed to recognize we aren't fully formed and resist our own good reasons and let God teach us to hear him. Love requires God speak with a still small voice. So up until now, I've been kind of laying out the error of our own inner thought life, our own inner voice, our own judgments. But I want to talk to you for just a second about what it means to hear God and practically what that's kind of like, okay? So hearing God is a faith choice. It's always going to be a faith choice. For the rest of your days, for millions and millions and millions and millions of years, you're going to have to hear something that he doesn't make you believe and make a choice in his character, that he has a good future for you, and that it leads you to obedience. Faith, hope, and love, they remain, according to 1 Corinthians 13. They're going to always remain, okay? So love requires God speak with a still small voice. I want you to read, hear this story. 1 Samuel 3, 1 to 15. Now the boy Samuel ministered to the Lord before Eli. Now if you know the story, you know Eli was, he was guilty of some really significant sin in the nation of Israel. He was the high priest. His kids were priests. His kids were not following the way of the Lord. They were using their position for their own greed and their own gain. They were defiling the offering of the Lord. And Eli wouldn't do anything about it. He never judged it with God, though he was the judge of Israel. He judged it with his own reasons. And God was not happy about this. But he speaks to Samuel. But listen to this. The word of the Lord was rare in those days, page two of the notes. There was no widespread revelation. It was very uncommon to hear God in those days. Is it uncommon to hear God now? No. Why? Holy Spirit. It's actually, you can can literally hear God by asking and receiving. Anybody can do it. Anybody. There was, uh, revelation was rare in those days. There was no widespread revelation. The word Lord was rare in those days. And it came to pass at that time while Eli was lying down in his place, the high priest was laying down in his bedroom, when the, his eyes had begun to grow so dim that he could not see. And before the lamp of God went out in the tabernacle of the Lord, so they're in the place where God was being worshipped, where the ark of God was, and while Samuel was lying down, that the Lord called Samuel and he answered, here I am. So right there, Samuel's like, here I am. Did God speak to him? Why not? Who was he saying, here I am to? Eli. Yeah, yeah, that's what you meant. You meant Eli, yeah. He, the boy Samuel heard Samuel, and he said, here I am. He responded. He was responding to the wrong God, the wrong voice. He was responding to the guy he assumed was, everybody say assume, assumed was talking to him. Now, you assume some things about God that aren't God right? So if God says something, you're like, here I am, hard God. Is he going to keep talking to you? He's going to wait for you to figure out who he is, right? To come to the realization of who he is. Now listen, here I am. So he ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. And he said, I did not call. Lie down again. And he went and lay down. Then the Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel rose and went to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. He answered, I did not call you. I said, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, nor was the word of the Lord yet revealed to him. He didn't know. You don't know. God wasn't like, Samuel, that was your one chance. Goodbye, buddy. I'm going to find somebody else. Samuel didn't know. God knew Samuel didn't know. Why didn't God make it more clear to Samuel? He doesn't, he wanted to make things clear to Eli, and he wanted Samuel to decide who he was talking to. He wanted Samuel to know the God he was talking to, right? He wanted him to settle some things. The Lord called Samuel again the third time. So he arose and went to Eli, and he said, Here I am, for you did call me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord had called the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you must say, Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. He's like, you got to recognize, it's somebody you don't know, Samuel. 
Just tell him that. You're ready to hear what he's saying. Okay? So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel answered, speak for your servant hears. Then the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I will do something in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I've spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I've told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows because his sons made themselves vile and did not restrain them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. So Samuel will lay down until morning and open the doors of the house of the Lord. And Samuel was afraid to tell Eli the vision. If you hear God, he's going to tell you things that are not incons- they are not inconsequential. God has something on his mind right now. He wants his kingdom to come. So if you're like, God, I want to hear what you're saying. He's going to say things that are disruptive to the kingdom of the earth. They're going, to, they're going to be disruptive to things that are comfortable right now. Samuel didn't know this. He's learning this the hard way. This is kind of the only way to learn what God wants to talk about. But there are no kind of like, God, I just want to, you know, get the fuzzy picture in the youth group meeting, and I'll say, you know, the thing, and we'll interpret it. It'll be flowery, and nobody will be upset about it. That's practice. That's practice for, oh, God, I want you to talk to me. And yes, you have an agenda that is difficult for the flesh to receive, Right? He told Samuel something very difficult for Eli, and Eli was the one teaching Samuel how to hear God. This is hard. This is hard. God isn't wasting any time. Every word God speaks is consequential. This revelation, it produces authority. Samuel was, that's very, Samuel's very first shot of authority that he got right there, and he had a choice to make. Samuel could or could not tell Eli what God had told him. If he would have said no, We don't know what would have happened, but Samuel said yes and took the next step. Samuel didn't try to figure out all of the things that were going to happen and then be like, it's not worth it to tell Eli this thing. I'll just wait, be a little bit more diplomatic, a little bit more kind, a little bit better at, do you see, he could start reasoning good and evil. Yeah, I'm going to be faithful with the thing, just not right now because that's too hard. He, was, he would see it wrong. And he was feeling it. It's not like he wasn't tempted to it. He just, for whatever reason, got the grace of God to tell Eli exactly the thing God had said. And that started the entire story of David. Do you see what I'm saying? So God isn't wasting any time. Hearing God will always put you in a place of resistance. Hearing God isn't a parlor trick. It's not a way to manipulate people. It's very tempting to think that. You know, people that don't know God hear me hearing God, then they'll believe God is real. God doesn't work like that. He's not interested in that at all. He's just looking for people that don't really know what's going to happen. They don't take it upon themselves to figure out why God is doing what he's doing. They don't judge whether or not it's good or evil. They just know he said something and they're going to do it because he said to do it. And then they find out that was amazing. He did so much with so little, just a little bit of obedience. And he did a ton of God stuff. It will be like this forever. The seraphim, they cry, holy, holy, holy. The elders, they cast down their crowns when they hear the, just the revelation of who God is and worship reverberates all through heaven, but it's God that's making all of that happen. He's giving the revelation. He's giving the grace for the seraphim to speak. He gives the grace for the elders to see. He gives the elders the grace to lay down their crowns. All of it is just people saying yes to the next step. There's so much patience in heaven. David and I were in prayer meetings probably about two months ago and maybe longer than that. And God was talking to us about just see the eternity of time and you'll get patience. So like you, it'll take all the pressure off of what you do today and you can actually be with me today and enjoy today. You don't have to figure out everything that's going to happen. The impatience comes from such a short view of time and thinking all the pressure is on this day or this day or this day. Like just come with me. Take the next step with me. Learn how to hear me. You're not running out of time. You're not running out of time to become holy or righteous. You're wasting time, though, not trying to hear me. So it's not a parlor trick. It's not a way to manipulate people, make a living, provide, for our, provide ourselves with a good life. That's the heir of Balaam. Or a way to draw attention to God. Hearing God is part of his government. And it takes faith. It actually takes knowing Samuel's process of, I got this thing. I kind of think that's what God said. But I don't know what's going to happen with it. I haven't figured out what it means yet. I don't even know if it's good or evil. I just want to hear him speak. I got this invitation. I want to hear him speak. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to try to be faithful what he's already given me. I'm just going to take that next step. I'm not going to figure out if I'm qualified to do it or unqualified to do it. I'm not going to figure out all the things, my reasons, 
I'm just going to do it. Now, we've had several examples of this this morning in this room. That's no accident. Lonnie, he got something from God, and he's like, I'm just going to put it out there. I don't know what's going to happen with it, but I know I'm supposed to say it. Jen got something like that. Sam got something like that. Steph got something like that. I mean, and even Steph's word was like, I don't even know what it means. I just know I'm supposed to say it. And Luke knew what it meant. And it impacted all of us. I mean, people were starting to cry because Luke knew what it meant. But if Steph hadn't said that thing, she didn't even know what was going to happen. It wouldn't have been an open door for Luke to walk through the next step and a bunch of us to be like, oh, he's actually talking to me. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? This is where the whole church is going, what I'm describing. All church, all church will be like this by the time Jesus comes back. The false church, the harlot Babylon, will be more and more onerously strict about what people have to do, even to the point where worshiping the Antichrist is required at the pain of death. This has happened many times on the earth, I want to tell you. Many times a collective of people has decided this is the way we're going, and if you don't go this way, you're done. The church is going to do this. We don't want to be that part of that church. We want to be a part of the free church that listens to God, says things in faith, takes risks, are willing to hear God say hard things to us and say, you know what? It's, this is the way it works. This is the way that it works. Like that person that said the hard thing that they thought God was saying, they're a child. They don't even know. But I can hear God through them. I can take all of the judgment about what their intentions were, whether, whether it was evil. I can take all that out and just say, God, say that. And if you did, I want to respond to it. But if we're like, I don't really think God said that because I don't trust you. So I'm going to make all these judgments about whether or not you're good or evil. And then I'm going to come to the place where I have no hope that God's willing to work with broken people so that I don't even think he'll work through my brokenness, then I'm going to lose all of my obedience, all the love. Do you see what I'm saying? We have to have a right view of God and the way that he uses broken, weak, childlike people to speak things to us. And that he uses us to speak things to other people. And that it's not all based on if you hear God, it must mean that you, you know, you cross all your T's, dot all your I's, you don't drink any alcohol, you don't eat this thing, you don't do that thing. God talks to, I mean, I don't know if you know this or not, God talks to people that are deep in sin sometimes. He talked through a donkey to talk to Balaam. <laughs> if he's willing to use a donkey, he's willing to use anything. So we can't make assumptions about holiness or non-holiness because God's using something. We come up to him and we're like, God, I don't even really know what this means. Do you get what I'm saying? I don't know if I'm being that clear. Okay. So if God only does what we feel is right, we've made ourselves God. This is very tempting. I know it's right because it feels right to me. I prayed about it. This feels right. That's not God. No. It's God because it changes who I am. It's the fruit of the Spirit. It's making me more patient. It's making me more kind. It's making me more gentle, more self-controlled. Do you see what I'm saying? That's how I know I'm hearing God. I don't know I'm hearing God because something feels right. There's most things that I care a lot about. And I tell Sam this all the time. I can't hear God about these things. They're, I'm too emotionally involved. There's too much. Last, last time I got a chance to speak, I said, God's here. We're here, right? We shouldn't use this if he's here. But in between here and here, there's a whole lot of us, a whole lot of emotion. There's a whole lot that gets in the way of hearing God. Eli was helping Samuel get some of that assumption out of the way. We have a lot of different assumptions that we make about what's going to happen or what people's intentions are or what God is doing, whether or not he's faithful to do it. But if we could just get to the place where we're confident he wants to talk to us, we just keep talking to him step by step by step. We're going to find he does something. We don't even know what he wants to do. If you want that, stand with me. Jen, you want to come back up? I think that's enough. There's a ton more in the notes, like so much more in the notes. Especially those verses about faith. I would just encourage you, if what I'm talking about is like, oh, you know, that sounds kind of like a better version of following God. I would encourage you to pray through the verses about faith. Like, skip all the rest of the notes. Pray through some of the verses about faith. Just say, God, you like faith this much. I want to I see faith the way you see it. You'll find you'll do things different this week if you do it. You just say, thank you, give me more. That's the way Mike Bickelow says, thank you for faith. Give me more. I want more of that. Then, if you like want more than that, look at the notes too and, and pray about those too. So if you want to hear God, you're going to hear him. I, I did this a few weeks ago, and I was up north hunting with Noah. Can I show that, Noah? And Noah's like, Dad, ever since you prayed that, I prayed it. God did it. 
There's several things Noah has written that he shared with me. Like, God, God's speaking to Noah right now just because he prayed it. It wasn't because I prayed it. It's because Noah prayed it. If you want to hear God more, we're going to ask him, and he's going to do it. It's going to be faint. It's going to require some faith. It's going to require, actually, that we put aside all the accusation and condemnation that comes with it from Satan. And we're just like, you know what? God speaks to me because he likes me. <laughs> he's not expecting me to be perfect to hear him. He's expecting me to be willing to hear him. Holy Spirit, in this room, just let's raise our hands before him. There's a big angel in this room, I just want to tell you. And the enemy, he really wants to steal this from you, but he's not going to be able to because this angel is like, no. <laughs> Holy Spirit, in this room right now, we want to hear God. God, we have challenges in front of us this week that we're tempted to make decisions about how we feel about it, what we think about it, what to do about it. Sin, God, we know our sin and we want to fix it because we want to be with you, but we can't speak to us. God, just tell us the next thing. It's the next thing to do. Forgive us for trying to be righteous without you, God. Speak to us. Just send your fire right now. Send your fire. Touch us, Lord. Some of us are going to have gold, uh, like little gold specks. He just said, I just, I'm just saying, I'm talking to you. I'm talking to you. Holy Spirit, pour out in this room right now. Pour out in this room. Pour out. We're open, God. Just tell them, I'm open. <laughs> I'm open. I'm going to forget what's behind me. I'm going to forget all my misunderstandings before. I want to take the next step now. I'm open. In Jesus' name, amen.